Good morning, everybody. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to see all of you as much as I can um, in the lights. I'm pleased that you were able to make it. I was pleased to have um, two great speakers as a warm-up act, um, and I'm particularly pleased that you've come to see a topic as exciting as data, which isn't always exciting, right? Um, I hope I can make it that way for you today. Before I do, though, um, I want to give you, I want to show you a picture and ask you a question and get you to reflect. So just have a look at that for a second, that blue line. I don't know whether that's uh, something which will be familiar to you or not. Um, does that pattern mean anything to you? Just take a moment to think what it might be. So for the Financial Times, that represents the daily uh, news consumption in digital. It shows how news is consumed throughout the course of the week. You can see the daily cycle Monday to Friday and a quieter weekend period. What's interesting um, is that it represents um, how content's consumed digitally on laptops and PCs. And you can see that it's very closely aligned to the business day. You can see that it picks up 9 o'clock in the morning um, and 5 o'clock in the afternoon, it starts to tail off again because people use the FT digitally to help them in their work. They use it at their desks when they're in the office. So take a look at the red line. Take a moment to reflect and see what might that be. <clears throat> So the red line represents um, consumption of FT digital content on a smartphone. What's interesting, of course, is that it's actually radically different to the, to the blue line. You can see it's almost the complete opposite, that people consume our content digitally on a smartphone outside of working hours, first thing in the morning and in the afternoon. So they're on their way to work, and they're on their way home from work. These are people who are largely commuting and using their smartphone to get ahead of their day, to learn about what they need to know and to wrap up their day and think about tomorrow. So this is a really simple example, but something which is really important, because smartphones have only really been news consumption devices for the last five years, and yet hugely important now as a mechanism for, for consuming news. And we need to be able to see these trends, to understand how the trends are evolving, so that we can be sufficiently nimble and recalibrate our businesses. And I think this is true in news media, as I suspect it is in your businesses too. And certainly, we've done a lot of recalibration off the back of this data, which I will share with you. There's been something of a revolution in news media over the last 20 years since we started um, to have digital channels. The Financial Times was a very early adopter of charging for access to content digitally. You needed a subscription to read the FT. What that meant was they forged a path in building direct-to-consumer relationships, actually. Um, and this is something that's very new to publishers. We didn't historically have direct relationships with our readers because we sold newspapers to newsstands. And the people who ran the newsstands had the direct relationship with the reader. This is quite a fun fundamental change, but completely crucial, actually, to our digital strategy. Customer centricity and that direct relationship is something that's very important to us and continues to be so. The other aspect of our digital strategy I want to point to is the use of data. We've built a very sizable data analytics capability, call it big data if you like, um, which sits at the very heart of our organization, helping to bring behavioral information into everything that we do, into all parts of our operation. And I will talk more about some of those examples um, as, to, as to how and where we're doing that. What's important, though, is putting these two things together. It's putting customers in the center thinking about what we do in the context of our customers and combining it with the ability to understand, monitor, measure all of the things that you've already heard about this morning 
to actually use that information to affect change in our organization. We see the use of data as a two-way street, right? We get information about behavior, about the demographics of our readers who register and subscribe to access our content. That helps us to understand their needs. It helps us to anticipate what we need to do next for them. Whether that's in our strategy, whether in our product development, whether in building services that tailor and personalize our product to meet their more specific needs. It's definitely a two-way street, and it's when we put those two things together that we see it's been a significant catalyst of our digital growth. And our digital growth actually is something that we're very proud of. The Financial Times now has over half a million paying digital subscribers. In fact, we have more digital subscribers than we print copies of the newspaper every day. And that is what's helping drive the greatest readership that we've ever had in our 127-year history. And we see data and customer centricity as the catalysts to that. So I want to give you some concrete examples of where and how we're using data to actually make that happen in a diverse range of places um, right across the organization. So I'll start with marketing. Um, since marketing is our heritage, we really started our data journey um, working with our marketing teams. And these are teams who are responsible for selling digital subscriptions. You might think I'm a bit crazy for putting this on the screen. You might wonder, what on earth is this? Well, for the uninitiated, this is the output of a statistical model, which predicts the likelihood that somebody who's accessing our website, a prospect, is likely to purchase a subscription. But it does more than that. It's not just predicting that likelihood. It's also telling us when is the best time to communicate with that person. How should we communicate with them? And what should we talk about when we communicate with them? Here's an example. This is one way in which we might deliver that message. We deliver our messages by email through adverts which are targeted behaviorally on our website, or perhaps through a call from somebody in our customer services team, inbound or outbound. We use the information from the predictive model to determine what we might say. So in this instance, um, what we've actually done is to ascertain the topic that somebody is going to be interested in. We've said, based on your behavior, um, we've seen that we think you're likely to be very interested in the Eurozone crisis. So we'll tell you about that in our marketing. We'll tell you, actually, subscribe now and get more coverage of the Eurozone crisis. This tailoring and personalization, we call them propensity models internally, is helping us um, to, to, to really turbocharge our marketing. And we see the closer we get to being able to personalize them, when we can distill the essence of people's interests, the better response we get. And this is a key driver of our customer acquisition at the Financial Times. Changing tack completely into editorial, into the newsroom. This is a tool that we built um, specifically for, for journalists um, in our newsroom. They can go in and find the stories that they published, and it provides them with real-time feedback about what, how their content's performing. It allows them to understand the ebb and flow of topics that are being consumed, the changes in the news agenda, because as you all know as communicators, the news agenda changes second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour, and they need to be able to keep up. News does not stay relevant for very long. They can log in here, and they can see not just what's popular, but actually what are the drivers um, behind why their content is being consumed. Where is this traffic coming from? How are people discovering their content? They can see to what extent are people commenting on the stories that they've published. Is this a story that's been big in social media? All of these are really important cues. And it's not to say um, that we want to edit by numbers, because we never will. Um, we will never be guided by the most popular, because we're not in the volume game. We're in the quality game, in producing quality content. But this does provide helpful feedback to the journalists in thinking about what they might want to do next, 
in thinking about how they promote their content, in thinking about how they engage in channels like social media or search engine optimization in order to um, attract the kind of readers and the kind of engagement that we want to see. Next, I want to talk about how we use data in product development. We, I think five years ago, digital product development was more straightforward. We didn't think that at the time. But actually, all we had to do was run a website, and that seemed kind of easy. Fast forward five years, and these are all of the places where you can consume the FT digitally. On an iPhone, on an iPad, on a smartphone, on Flipboard, on Google Newsstand, on your Samsung Smart TV, on an Android device, on iOS. It's everywhere. And we need to understand how readers are using all of these different channels today and what they want to use tomorrow. Technology is evolving so quickly, and our business has to evolve to meet that need. And our data and our ability to see and understand what our readers do is really crucial in helping us to test and iterate our products. We've built a very significant capability around experimentation so that actually we can test a new concept. We call it a minimum viable experiment that allows us actually with some of our readers to test something new, to try it out. In many cases, without even writing a single line of code. And that's really important because as technology is evolving so quickly, News consumption is changing so rapidly, and we're constantly reinventing our business to adapt to that change. We need to be nimble. And actually, it's exactly that kind of experimentation and testing on our acute use of data and understanding the needs of our readers that helps us to be nimble and to adapt. So all of the examples I've given you so far are internally focused. Here's one which is externally focused. We're very interested in helping our readers to, to do what I call navigating the news. So on the right-hand side there, you see an example of a recommendation engine that we have that recommends content to people based on their browsing behavior, much the same way as Amazon might recommend, recommend a book to you. We recommend stories that you might want to read. We've been testing out different kinds of CRM and email communications where we tell you about your usage, about your behavior. We tell you about topics that we think are going to be of interest to you, whether it's companies, regions, um, you know, other things that are going on in the news agenda, to help you to navigate more specifically to the things that really matter to you. Because we know, actually, if we can do that, we can help you save time. It's not to say that algorithms will replace journalists or even replace what we do, but we do believe that there's a significant role to play in both the individual space and in the corporate market um, in helping our readers to stay ahead by feeding off their peers. So this is a very early stage prototype of a tool that we've built for our corporate customers, for information managers who manage a large um, you know, account of, uh, of subscribers who access FD content. And actually, what we're doing for them is helping them to understand readership within their organization so that they can identify which stories are particularly popular with their staff, so that they can highlight them um, elsewhere, so they can talk about the topics and the stories that really matter in their industry and to their organization. We're saving them time. We're helping them find the, the, the stories that really matter, helping them find things they wouldn't have otherwise found. They're getting better value for money from their subscriptions. So whether for individuals or for corporations, we're using data to help people better navigate the news, which I'm sure is something that you as communicators will appreciate is a very difficult challenge. But so far, all of the things I've talked about have been about technology. You know, big data, the data technology we've got probably is the fuel in the tank for our digital growth, whether it's conversion rate optimization, whether it is multivariate testing, whether it's propensity models, all of these things are key and really important to us and have been key catalysts of our growth. But actually, where the rubber hits the road is where we get our staff, our people, to use the data. 
one of the things that we've come to realize as a news organization is that probably the most important thing for us is customer engagement, reader engagement. We've actually proved the relationship between how engaged our readers are and our revenue through increased customer acquisition, through uh, improving customer retention, through people reading more things and driving advertising revenue. There's a deep and strong relationship between reader engagement and revenue. This is really important to us, actually, because it's allowed us to focus on this as an organization-wide measure. But we don't just mean engagement in a very sort of nebulous sense. We have a very specific definition of engagement, and that's engagement with purpose. We've, in fact, defined a mathematical equation um, which combines three dimensions of reader behavior. Your recency of access, the frequency with which you access our content, so have you built habitual use? Are you coming back time and time again? And the number of articles that you read. We put all of those three things together, and we can say whether we think a reader is or is not yet engaged. Not only that, but we can provide some diagnostics that help us to understand how engaged they are and what we might do to engage them further. This empowers people across the organization, actually, to have um, information that they can use. So I work in marketing. How can I bring somebody back to the site who hasn't been for a while? I work in editorial. What can I do to help build frequent, habitual use of the content? I work in technology. What, what product or widget could I build to encourage people to read just one more page? This we see as a completely galvanizing objective which is changing the way that our organization works to focus much more on the outcome for the reader, encouraging them to read more and get more value for money from their subscription. So all you need to remember is my two equations that I talked about, if you like. At the beginning, I talked about customer centricity and the use of data we see as being one of the key catalysts to our digital growth and our digital growth story at the Financial Times. And further, that actually it's not just about the technology, but it's about how we use it and how we use that information to further deepen the engagement that we have with our readers and how we motivate, in fact, the whole organization um, to, to feel um, motivated to deepen that relationship too. And both of those things together, I think, are helping to continue to drive um, our significant digital growth. Thank you. Thanks, Tom.